Welcome to Comment with me, George Galloway, here on Press TV, still the voice of the voiceless. Comment is the big conversation, the great debate, but it can only be either of those, of course, if you join in. That's why, above all, I need your telephone calls. The number to dial is 442086014555. You call us, we'll call you back, establish a clear line, and remember, if you get on the television with me, the volume on your television has to be down at zero. Or I'll have to press swiftly on, because no one will understand either of us. I have been saying that for the last five years, but it's amazing how many people haven't heard me. SMS, uh, you can SMS me on 4478-0008066, or you can email me at comment at presstv.co. UK and you can tweet me at comment underscore press TV and those details will have come up on the screen but there's no need to bring up on the screen the subject that we're going to be discussing tonight because it is the news story above all news stories it is the news story that has resounded now over the last two to three weeks all around the world the Palestinian people in Gaza, locked up behind the wire, with all the gates closed against them, nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, have been subjected to a murderous and fantastically disproportionate onslaught from land, sea and air. Just in the last few minutes, uh, Israeli tanks firing indiscriminately, because a tank can only fire indiscriminately, it has no targeting mechanism in its weapon of any kind. All it can do is raise and lower its gun barrel. Have uh, bombed a hospital, uh, the Wafa hospital inside Gaza. No reports yet of deaths and casualties, but deaths and casualties appear certain. In just the last hour, I think, uh, maybe hour and a half, Israel has killed yet another four children in the last hour or hour and a half. I'm not talking about the four children on the beach in Gaza, though I intend to. I'm talking about the killing of children that has happened in the last hour or hour and a half. Now, there are certain moments, I've led a long political life, and I know when a matter or a moment of great significance occurs. I can see it, I can feel it. I can sense it, I can relate it to uh, the life that I have led and the experience that I have had. I had such a moment uh, in the Syria conflict when I saw the video of the man cutting out another man's heart and eating it. I told my closest associates there and then that this was a turning point, that nothing would ever be the same after this point, and that the high point of takfiri support around the world had just been reached and it would be all downhill from then on. And I was right about that. So listen to me when I tell you that the murder of those four children who were playing on the beach, an empty beach in Gaza, playing football, running around the sand, who disappeared in a puff of smoke, that's a similar turning point for a number of reasons. Of course, if it wasn't filmed, it didn't happen. But unfortunately for Israel, it was filmed. And it was filmed not by Press TV or RT. It was filmed by the Wall Street Journal. It was filmed by the main American networks. And do you know why? Because the journalists from the main mainstream, pro-Zionist, right-wing, capitalist networks in the United States had just been playing football with the four boys. They had repaired to a cafe, 
not 50 yards away to have a cup of coffee and the four boys they'd just been playing football with disappeared in a puff of smoke. They were eviscerated by Israeli fire. Indeed, one of the journalists, Peter Beaumont, tried to save one of the boys and his colleagues filmed him trying to save one of the boys, giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. That's why the story of the four murdered football-playing boys on the beach in Gaza is a turning point because now there's no hiding place. The US media is now reporting what we on Press TV have been reporting for months. It's now reporting what most of you watching me and I have known all along, that the settler state of Israel is a murder machine. It is murder incorporated. It was it was founded on violence, violence against the local population it ceased to displace and drive out, violence against the British uh, administration and uh, security forces that were supposedly trying to manage the competing nationalisms that were beginning to be played out in the state violence against the United Nations, which for a time Israel feared would not give it what it wanted, namely statehood. So when Count Bernadotte of Sweden, the UN special representative, was shot in the face and killed by Yitzhak Shamir, who went on to become the Prime Minister of Israel, that's the kind of violence that Israel was born out of with increased technology, fantastic developments in weaponry. They have now developed a military superiority over a defenseless, practically defenseless, locked up civilian population in a big concentration camp. They can rain down death and destruction all day and all night, militarily. But politically, that's not so. In fact, this kind of horror that you're watching here has bankrupted Israel in the world. You see, in 1982, just before they invaded Lebanon and just before they carried out the massacre in Sabra and Shatila, Israel had quite a healthy bank balance of political capital in the world. But from Sabra and Shatila onwards, that bank balance has been running down. It is now utterly bankrupt. And the scenes you've just watched and which have now been seen by the United States public, the story of this young boy in Jerusalem who had petrol poured down his throat and who was set on fire. These acts of barbaric savagery have bankrupted Israel's position in the world. Now, of course, People still move, to use Shakespeare's term, they still move for Israel, but no longer out of love, but out of interest. And interest can change. You see, the love that Israel once had, I think wrongly, but once had by the public opinion around the world is now absolutely gone. Only those who are paid to do so and only those who are themselves fanatic Zionists any longer can defend the crimes that the rest of us have now been watching in Palestine, in Gaza, over these last weeks. So if no one moves for Israel out of love, but only out of interest, the day must be coming when they will no longer move because their calculus of their interest has changed. I want to make just a couple of other observations. The BBC has disgraced the country by its coverage of this crisis in Gaza. Other networks too, Sky a little better, and most of the American networks much worse. The difference is that the BBC is paid for by me, you, and the other license fee payers in Britain. 
They have a duty to us in the way that Rupert Murdoch does not. That's why I have declared that I will no longer pay a license fee to the BBC so that they can lie to the British people about Gaza, about Palestine, and many other things. They can take me to court, but they may have to take a lot of people to court. Because since I declared that I was no longer paying my license fee to the BBC, a very large number of people have similarly declared. So the BBC are going to be very, very busy chasing all of us, hundreds of thousands of us, potentially maybe millions of us over the next uh, period. So um, I just wanted to make one further observation before going to the telephones. And that is the performance of the British political class. David Cameron declared that he stood, and I'm quoting him, staunchly. For those of you who are not native English speakers, this means firmly, robustly, absolutely. He stood staunchly behind Israel. Nick Clegg, the Liberal Democrat leader, I'm not even going to waste any breath upon. But Ed Miliband, the Labour leader, has throughout this crisis not uttered a single word about it. He's the man who last year, very, very unwisely indeed, declared 